Welcome to Zig for the Uninitiated. My name is Tyler. Let's get started. I want to focus today on what Zig can do at compile time. Build time is a whole other thing, right? What's great about Zig, you know, any programming language is going to allow us to operate things on runtime. And any or most compiled program languages allow us to do some things at compile time. What's great about Zig is we get runtime dynamics, of course. You get comp time with compile time at compile time, and you get a build system. This video is obviously not about the Zig build system. We'll get into that in a different build, a uh, different video. But what I want to talk about is Zig's comp time and what it can do and why it's so awesome, why people love it. So let's look at some code here. So first thing I want to talk about is generics. In Zig, comp time is how generics are implemented. Uh, in other languages, or in, in, yeah, in other languages, when you want to write something that is generic, for example, a, um, a container of some type, right? And the list, an array list, like we use in Zig, you want that to be able to work over different types that are being contained. You don't want to have to write my integer array list and my uh, bespoke structure array, array list. You don't want to have to write different you know, write the code or worse copy, you know, I mean, not worse, I don't know. You won't have to just copy that code around and then change what's in there when everything should just work. All I want is the type, the inner type to change. And that's where generics come in. And in Zig, the way we write generics is actually using comp time and functions. And so when you see a function, we're, let's take a look at this as an example here. When you see a function, my contain, right? Here we have my container. In Zig, by convention, any function that has uh, this kind of type case, this you know camel case, I know I know that's the proper name for it. Any function that has a camel case uh, name is going to be a function that generates a new type and is a generic um, type. And so you can see my container takes in some type t. It's a function that takes a type T and returns a new type. And what we can do is then just return a new struct. And we can give that struct uh, a field, items. And we can make that field an array, or rather here, a slice of T. And so once we've declared that container is, you know, can be parameterized by a type T, we can then use this T as a type elsewhere throughout the, the function and throughout the struct um, that we eventually generate. So we can even call a new function and call that function, right? It takes itself as a parameter. So this is gonna be a method on the struct. And it takes in some new item because this is the insert function, T, and it takes an index where we wanna insert into and it will return nothing. Uh, and it'll do self to items, you know, index is item and here we have generated a generic type now this obviously isn't going to work because um, we have nowhere to actually allocate this memory you're not getting this memory from anywhere but if you were actually going to do this seriously you could do that and this is how you would implement your own generic container in zig and generics are a prime example of where you'd want to use a compile time information because the way generics work in Zig, and you know, I can say this in Rust, um, in C++ when you use templates, I'm pretty sure it works this way. Uh, what you're doing is generating new functions at compile time, right? So what happens, or new types at compile time, and new functions that go along with those types and, and, and all that. And so what I mean by that is my container, this doesn't really exist at, uh, once the code's compiled, but for every type that I use this with, right? So if I come down here, I have my container U32, and I name it, I can do the same thing. Let's do this uh, with an I32. The code will generate copies of this insert function, but one with U32, and another one with an I32. And this is a process, if you're familiar with Rust, they call this mono, well, I'm not sure it's just Rust, but called monomorphization, where as opposed to polymorphism, where you have one interface 
that allows you to go to different things. Monomorphization is you have one interface that then generates one uh, or new types for every type. All right, now let's take a look at conditional compilation. Conditional compilation is another thing like generics that other languages have. So this is unique to Zig, but it is a super beneficial feature. It allows you to compile your code differently based off of different compile time or build time, compile time known values. And so for example, I didn't want to write my own example here. I think that the standard POSIX close is actually a really great example of this. So we're just going to look at the standard libraries version to then show what happens with conditional compilation. So if you look at standard POSIX close, this is the way we close a file descriptor in POSIX or, you know, once you've opened a file, you've got to close it. You'll see that the function has a, a big if statement. It checks this if the native OS, right? So if the OS that the program was compiled for is Windows, then it will call the Windows function. And if the, uh, the program was call, uh, compiled for is WASI, or if the operating system that was compiled for is WASI, and it wasn't linked to libc, then we'll call the WASI close function. Otherwise, we'll call some system close. So what we see here, it looks like just a big if statement. And this is where I think people really love Zig's comp time, because you don't realize here that all this is actually happening at compile time. It looks like regular Zig code, which if you were to look at this in C, the a similarly translated value in C, you'd have a bunch of pound defines and ifs and all that, and it would look pretty messy. But this is super nice because it looks like regular Zig code, but it is actually compile time code because this native OS is guaranteed to be compile time known because it comes from the built-in module. If you look at the built-in module, it's really just a bunch of information about the machine that the computer, or sorry, the machine that the program was compiled for. And I say that specifically, what the machine was, or the machine that the program was compiled for, not the machine that the program was compiled on, because Zig supports amazing cross compilation abilities. I can compile on my Linux machine something for Windows. I just can't run it. And I could compile something for Mac on my Linux machine. And it would make use of this information correctly. It wouldn't mess up here. What's also great about this is where it looks like there's a whole bunch of runtime ifs statements, which can be, you know, a little uh, less performant. What this really compiles down to if I'm running on Windows, or rather if I compile this for Windows, is it's just gonna be, it's gonna get rid of all those if statements. And it's just gonna be a call to close handle. And in fact, it'll probably inline this call. So that's conditional compilation in a nutshell. It can be super beneficial. And it's not just for uh, cross-platform uh, stuff. It can be for whether you're compiling a debug version or release version. There's other different kinds of variables that you can use. In fact, you can use Zig's build system to inject different uh, value, uh, different variables to then conditionally compile the, fun, uh, the program differently. Next is going to be reflection. And where we talked about generics and conditional compilation, other languages have those features. And I'm not even saying that other languages don't have reflection, but I haven't seen it like Zig's comp time reflection. So if you aren't familiar with what reflection is, reflection is a way that a program is able to look at itself. It's a way to see its information about the types and about itself. And it can be super powerful, but in a lot of languages it's implemented at runtime, which means that it imposes a cost to the program. But Zig gets done at comp time. And Zig types are first class citizens with an asterisk. <laughs> types are first class citizens at compile time, but they do not exist after that. And I think that that's really important to, to understand because I've seen that trip some people up. Types are first class citizens, but only at compile time, which means that we're able to do compile time reflection on, um, on Zig types. And we're able to get really uh, good information about types at compile time. Let's take zigzag encoding as an example. 
uh, that we can use to illustrate the value of, of comp time reflection. Zigzag encoding, if you aren't familiar with it, is a way to encode signed integers. So if you got one's complement or two's complement, those are the way the machine, two's complement really is the way most machines encode uh, signed integers. But sometimes you might be working on something and you'll want to use zigzag encoding. And zigzag has no relation to zig. Uh, zigzag encoding, the way it works is that it uses the lowest order bit to indicate if a value is positive or negative. And so that's why it's called zigzag, because that lowest order bit always flips between zero or one. And so you're always zigging and zagging back and forth between positive and negative values. So all the even numbers are going to be positive or zero. And all the negative numbers are going to be uh, odd. And so you can see I've got an example written here. Zero it maps to zero. And uh, zero one maps to negative one. And one zero maps to one. And one one maps to negative two. And you can see how it goes back and forth. Well, I've had to write a zigzag encoder, uh, decoder for some other um, code. And, and I ran into a problem once, which is, Zig can have practically arbitrary integer sizes, right? So you can have an I1, you can have a U7, a U53, a U2352. These are all valid integer sizes or integer types in uh, Zig. And when I want to zigzag encode, I'd like to be able to write one function that works for any of those types. And so you start thinking about generics, right? A function that works over multiple types. And so we are going to use generics. But what I'd really like is to be able to also enforce some type safety on that. I'd like to be able to say, if I give you a U32, I want to make sure I get an I32 back. And then backwards, right? If I'm encoding an I32, I like to make sure that I get a U32 back. I don't want to have to upcast all my values into one. I'd like to be able to carry that information forward through the function. So how can we do that? Well, with comp time reflection, that's how we can do it. If we take a look at our from zigzag function, which we don't need to look at the implementation because it's really not interesting. What's really interesting about it is the uh, declaration here. We can see that it takes a type T and an integer of that type T. So here we're able to declare some we're able to parameterize this function across a different type, a make it generic over type T. And we say, OK, it is that it's going to take a value that is of that type T. And we want to return a signed version of that type T, right? Because this is a from zigzag. We want to take an unsigned T, an unsigned integer, and return a signed version of that. Well, how can we do that? Let's, let's implement this, this function. The signed function is going to take some type T and return a new type. So you can already see this is a generic function. But how, how can we do that? Well, I'm going to cheat here. In another video, we'll go in more in depth about how this works. It's the same principle as what I'm showing here, which is through comp time reflection. To make it more simple, we're going to use this in a, a little cheat. <laughs> I don't know if it's cheating. In the standard library, there's a module called standard.meta, which has a lot of beneficial functions for metaprogramming. And one of them is int, which is a function that allows you to generate uh, at compile time different integer type functions. So if we look at this function, it takes two parameters. The first one is signedness. And you can note that both these functions have to be comp time. We have to give it at compile time. We can't generate this signedness at runtime. Signedness is just an enum that has two values, signed or unsigned. And clearly, for the signed function, we want to make it signed. But now we need the bit count. What we would like is be able to get information from the type that was given about how, what its bit count was. Because bit count here can be uh, anything from 0 to U16 max. How can we get that information? Well, like I said, comp time reflection. And Method for comp time reflection is going to be this built in uh, function at type info. And we can give it a type. When you use type info, you give it the name of a type. Or you give it a type. I shouldn't just say name. 
and it will give you back a union that has the type information about it. And so what you'll want to know is what kind of type you have. Here I know that this T is going to be an int, or rather it should be an int. And if it isn't, right, if I pass something else to this function and T is not an integer type, it'll generate a compile error. So that's great. You still get comp compilation error checking there. I'm going to say it's an int and bits is the value to u16 and it's the number of bits that the integer has and like that we're able to generate a function that then takes in a type an unsigned integer and returns the signed version of it all right i have some tests here you can see that on the tests i have from zigzag and i use u32 or in u2 and i test it out we know that zero should be zero one should be negative one and two should be one if I run zig build test, you'll see it passes. This has been a, a brief introduction to how comp time can work and, and some of the benefits that you can see it. So I hope you've gotten a good taste of it and gotten some excitement about different ways that you might be able to use comp time. In my next video, I want to go more in depth into uh, comp time syntax and usage. But yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Leave them questions down in the comments or head over to Zigit uh, and leave your questions there. Happy coding.